All right, guys, so this video is about the ethics. Uh, this will be kind of a part one of two uh, videos that will pretty much kind of cover everything that we need to know for the ethics portion of it. There's a few definitions that we have to be really clear about uh, that we'll cover, and then the rest of it is more of more procedural. It's more of if, if you see this, you got to kind of flow, it's a little bit of a flow chart, and then that should kind of carry you through this uh, ethics session. So again, this is video number one, and we hope it's helpful. All right, guys, so here's the uh, ethics. It says, as the attending physician, you are caring for a 68-year-old man who is homeless and stage 3 uh, chronic kidney disease. The patient had an ulceration of his right great toe and that you recommend amputation or risk sepsis as the tissue is non-viable. The patient decides to decline the surgery and then refuses IV antibiotics and requests a discharge. By recommending amputation, the physician the physician is demonstrating which of the following? Is it A, justice, B, non-maleficence, uh, C, beneficence, or D, respect for autonomy? So this is where, where this whole um, ethics comes into question. Now these are just basic definitions. So when it comes to justice, that's just essentially uh, fairness, okay? It's fairness of procedures, essentially across all people, okay? So you have people treated equal, okay? And that's just kind of in the word justice, pe uh, people treated um, equal, okay? Now, uh, male means Latin, it means bad, so do no harm, right? Non-maleficence, I have trouble with that word. So anyways, what that basically means is that the physician's gonna just basically avoid you know, you're going to avoid high-risk procedures. Uh, you're not going to do something that's going to put the patient at risk and have very little, uh, very little benefit. Okay, uh, you know, there's like a box where they say, uh, you know, here, like there's reward and then there's risk, and then you can say high, and then low, and then you know, it's one of those things that the risk is high, but the reward is high. Then you know, you got to put it to consideration. If the risk is low and the reward is high, then of course you're going to do it. And then if the risk is high, but the reward is low, this is where it comes in. You want to do no harm, okay? Do no harm. Now, beneficence, bene, uh, Latin for good, um, is that you want to act in the patient's best interest, okay? Act in patient's best interest. So again, justice, is, justice means fairness. Non-maleficence -male means avoid the high risk, do no harm. Beneficence means, you know, act in the patient's best interest, you know, do good. And then D means uh, that respect for autonomy means you just got to respect preferences, okay? You guys got to res respect what, what they want. It's their life, what they want to do. So in this situation, you know, the doctor's recommending amputation, but, you know, because of risk of sepsis, but the question reads, and this is the key part, because, you know, I know you, you, you may want to jump on the respect for autonomy, but the question reads, by recommending amputation, the physician is demonstrating which of the following. You know, he's not saying that he's going to, that, that by saying, yeah, I understand you don't want to do it, it's your choice. That's not what they're asking. They're saying by recommending amputation, and by recommending the amputation, you are, or you are trying to act in the patient's best interest, best interest, and that's why the correct answer would be C, Beneficence. Okay, there's a difference. Now, if I again, if I would have said by respecting the patient's desires not to have the amputation, then you would say, okay, well now he's demonstrating respect for autonomy. Now, there's a follow-up question. It says, in reference to the above case, what would be the next step in to determine whether the patient understands his condition? Uh, this is kind of real life stuff here. The severity of the situation, the potential consequences, and the ability to communicate a consistent choice of his values. So, you know, you got a guy, and, and the doctor even said, look, man, if you don't do this, you're going to get sepsis. So before you just let the guy walk, you know, you really want to make sure that the guy has what? Is it A, competence? Now, just remember, competence is, it's a, that is a legal term, right? You got to have a judge. Um, to do, to really kind of uh, make that determination. Obtain informed consent, or is it C, capacity evaluation, or D, calling risk management? So I know right now you're like, well, man, if I don't know what to do, I'm going to call risk management. True, but they're looking, you know, on these step exams, they're looking to say, what, you know, what is the actual, you know, you're a competent, you are a competent physician, what would you do? Now, obtaining informed consent. Informed consent is essentially saying there's a voluntary 
that they're voluntary and they're willing uh, to, to accept treatment, okay? That's essentially, so obtaining informed consent, first of all, means that they're voluntary and willing to accept treatment, and you've discussed the risks, benefits, you know, uh, consequences of, say, not having the procedure, and, you know, alternatives and stuff like that. So, but, but the difference is obtaining informed consent means they're voluntary and willing. Capacity evaluation, okay? Capacity evaluation is essentially determining if the patient understands the severity of the situation, the potential consequences, communicates a consistent choice. In a capacity evaluation, which is typically done, you know, a lot of times hospitals would go to the psychiatrist and ask this, but any physician, any physician can do a capacity evaluation. But when you look at that, you're, you're essentially asking them, you know, do they understand, you know, do they understand their condition? Do they understand the risks, benefits of treatment or no treatment? You know, is this, uh, you know, what is the, uh, you know, again, what's the consequence of refusing treatment? And essentially, is this a, is this a decision that is consistent with their beliefs, okay? With, you know, bleeds for a long, long held time. Now, if the patient, you know, if this guy says, look, you know, I understand this, and he verbalizes back to you that I understand if I have the procedure, this happens. If, if, I, if the procedure doesn't happen, doesn't occur, I could risk, you know, consequences, including death. Um, and this is a consistent, a uh, long held belief that he has, then you would say the guy has capacity. But the first step in this thing, what you would do is when the guy refuses is to make sure that he understands what is occurring, his condition, the treatments involved, the consequences of refusing treatment, and then is this consistent with his long-held beliefs? So you get a capacity evaluation, and again, any physician can do a capacity evaluation. You're an attending physician at a community hospital during the overnight ED shift. You treat a 35-year-old male who was just brought in after wrecking his car. He mentions he was upset when he found the girl he's been trying to date with another man. He states that he needs to get patched up so he can go teach the girl and the man she was with a lesson. And if I can't have her, then no one will. What is the most appropriate next step in the safety of all parties? Is it A, speak with the patient and ask if he really means it? B, have the patient remain in the hospital and admit him medically? C, a psychiatric consultation to assess for involuntary status? D, notify risk management, or E, contact police and notify other part, the other parties involved. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of things, you know, what's tough on this step one sometimes is, is, is it's, it's kind of like real life versus, you know, what are they looking for in the answer choice that, it, that is real. You know, part of you is like, you know, what you would do if you're, if you're new in practice, you know, you'd be asking everybody around, hey, you know, be asking them, what do I do? You know, someone might even say, well, yeah, go call, go call risk management, but what, but look at this, even though there's probably 24 access, you got a guy in your emergency room who's, who's looking, hey man, get me ready so I just, I want, I just want to get out of here. You might not have time to do this. Um, you know, speak with him and see if he really means it. Well, of course you're gonna try to do that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, he's made these statements, you know, it sounds like he's, he's gonna be really adamant about doing it. So, so just by doing this, I don't think you're meeting the criteria to keep the community safe. Have the patient remain in the hospital and medically. Uh, only if there is, if, only if there would be a reason uh, to do that. That's kind of like kind of sidestepping it, saying, "Oh, you better come, you better be admitted." But at the end of the day, even if you admitted this guy, he could just walk out the door if he so choose and went after these people. Psychiatric consultation, it's not going to be quick enough, right? You're in the overnight ED shift; it just might not be quick enough. So all these sound reasonably well. But the one that you're gonna do, the one you're the one that you're gonna put down for your step one, two, and three exam, is you gotta you have a duty to warn. Now, you know this is this whole you know you might have heard obviously the uh, that Tarasov uh, decision that occurred. But the take home point of the Tarasov decision is you gotta you got a duty to warn, but essentially it's by like a reasonable means. Okay, Con you know contact police. You would either, and then try to notify the parties involved. You, you, you have to make a reasonable attempt to contact the people who are at risk from this. So all these other ones sound good, but what they're gonna be looking for is obviously pure safety. Contact police, notify the parties involved. That's based on that Terrasoft uh, decision that occurred a long time ago. 
it's a duty to warn and a lot of states it's just a, you have to do it by reasonable means. Now there's an acronym I've seen floating around uh, there that if you're, you know, how do you, you know, you go above and beyond where you override, uh, how do I say that you override the confidentiality, you know, and this is one of those situations where you would, right, where there's harm, and that one new uh, acronym is, it's called, you know, wait, you know, wait a second, wait a sec, and so the W is, is and there's wounds involved, right? There could be abuse when it's uh, automobile impaired driving. Uh, if, they're, if they're intoxicated, if there's an infectious disease, you know, if there's like TB, something that can harm the public, that's where you override con confidentiality. Terrasoft decision, obviously this violent stuff. Uh, suicide, elder mistreatment, and uh, child abuse. Any of those is where you'd go outside the box and uh, not just protect what the patient said between you and them, you'd actually have to protect the public. This one says, a 17-year-old female is seen by the primary care provider for birth control. The resident physician asks you about whether it's legal for them to prescribe birth control without the parent's consent. You educate the resident that despite being a minor and by definition, minors are not recognized to have capacity to understand their medical problems, you inform the resident that reproductive health qualifies as partial emancipation. Which of the following would not qualify under the same exclusionary clause for minors being emancipated? So what they're saying is there's five choices here, right? Four of these choices qualify as uh, someone who's less than 18 being emancipated from their parents and therefore they can make their own informed decisions and know about health care and, and such. Is it A, living independently, B, uh, self-supporting, C, being married, D, being in college, and E, active military? So which of the four actually would qualify for emancipation? Living independently, right? If they've already, you know, kind of uh, been on their, if they're on their own, they're kind of excluded from their parents, take care and funds and, um, and such, then they're essentially living independently, that would qualify them. They're self-supporting, kind of fits the same mold being married, um, whatever you know, state has that, and then um, active military. Those are all qualifications for eman being emancipated to where they can actually um, you know, make decisions on their own behalf. The one that doesn't qualify in this one is being in college. That's just more of a distractor, does not qualify you. So know the ones for emancipation, independently, self-supporting, being married, and active military. This one reads, a 60-year-old presented to the hospital after a fall. Three days into the admission, the patient slips into a coma and testing reveals brain bleeding that was not seen on the original head scan. The family has gathered in the family room and asked for an update. You report that, the, that a procedure can be performed that could save her life. But a nurse who was with the patient earlier in the day was told by the patient that, uh, was, that she didn't want any additional procedure performed and wanted to die peacefully. There is no living will or durable power of attorney for health care. The patient has passed away. The patient's husband passed away eight years ago. It appears that there is a disagreement on how to proceed. What would be the most appropriate person to make the decisions on the patient's behalf? Now you see there's a little flow chart that we're going to talk about here. But in this situation, they don't have a living will. They don't have any durable power, power, of, attorney, a power of attorney. So now you're looking at basically whoever's in that reception area. They said that the husband's, the patient's husband passed a long time ago. So which of these people is next in line per se? And sometimes there's a debate about who knows them best versus who's officially. But when there's a disagreement between everybody involved, that you got to go through a step procedure. Okay, and that's what you need to know for the step exam. What the, what the flow chart is. So it, it essentially goes from. Living will, right? That means that during when they had the capacity to make their own decision, they said, this is what I, my desires are if I were put in this situation. The next one would be a durable power of attorney, meaning they've, uh, they've appointed somebody that if I get into this situation that, you know, so-and-so uh, can be the one that speaks on my behalf. I trust them. And then you get into the patient's spouse, their adult children, uh, parents, and then you're getting into uh, siblings, okay? So you gotta be, um, you know, adult, I should clarify, it's adult siblings. So <clears throat> you gotta do this flow chart here, okay? Living will, durable power of attorney, 
spouse, adult children, parents, and then siblings. So in this situation, is it the patient's neighbor of 30 years who states, I know her the best? Now, you would like to go in this situation and say, hey, you know, we, we should, you know, if we can come to an agreement here, it'd be nice to, to understand what, what is the patient's wishes in this situation. So you want to be with the person who knows them the best, but, it, but when there's a disagreement, you can't just go because the neighbor says they know them the best, or even, people, even, if, even if majority of the family said yes, they know them the best. If there's a disagreement, you got to go with this. And this is what the step exam is going to test you on. The patient's 81-year-old mother who is still alive. You know, it sounds good, but the parent is kind of way down on the list here. The, the patient's twin sister who is competent, uh, that, that just goes to, um, you know, essentially siblings. It's even, that's even less than parent. Or the patient's oldest child. And in that situation, that's the, that's the one that's the, um, since we don't have living will, we don't have durable power attorney, and the spouse has already passed, it would be an adult their oldest um, child that would, that would make that decision, okay? This one says, a seven-year-old male with, neurological con with a neurological con condition that requires multiple procedures routinely to relieve his pain. Um, anyways, you're seeing this one. Prior to the next procedure, the parents are in disagreement with having continued care as the father feels his son has suffered enough and no longer wants the invasive procedures and states it's against his religious faith. The child's mother... The child's mother agrees to have the procedure. What is the next step in the management of this child? So this guy is, the, the dad is essentially saying it's against the faith. We can no longer put my, our child through this, this, this essential torture or, or this painful procedures. And the mom's like, hey, look, you know, we're going to keep on going. Uh, what do you do? Um, is it A, as one of the parents refuses, then we must respect the family's choice and not proceed? Is it B, ask, ask the child what he, what he wishes and then contact risk management? Is it C, proceed with the procedure as mother agrees? Or is it D, in the hierarchy of the family unit, the father is the decision maker and we respect his, his wishes? Okay, so we can get rid of that one first off, right? Now you're down to this. Now, you, chances are you're not going to ask a seven-year-old. You know, you might talk to the seven-year-old about how they're feeling, but they're, not, they're, they're seven years old, so they can't make that type of decision. But at the end of the day, when, you're, when one parent disagrees and one uh, agrees, you're, you are going to go, as long as you have consent, as long as you have consent from one parent, you're good to go, okay? So you're gonna, the correct answer would be proceed with the procedure as the, as the mother um, ag agrees with, this, with doing it, okay? So the, one of the last things on this video we're gonna talk about is the euthanasia versus physician assisted suicide, okay? Now, Euthanasia, long story short, illegal. Now, the difference between the two, right? You're thinking, well, what is the difference between the two? Euthanasia is when, essentially, you administer, or you administer a lethal uh, agent, per se. Lethal dose, lethal agent, whatever, whatever you know. It's like well, you're, you're, the, the, the doctor would do that, okay? That is illegal. It's never going to be your answer choice unless they say, what should you never do? Now, physician-assisted is going to be um, it's basically when the doctor prescribes, okay? When the doctor prescribes, so the patient can self-administer. So you see the difference between the two? Euthanasia, the doctor would do it. Physician-assisted, doctor prescribes, so the patient would do it. Um, and there's only a couple states. Uh, I, think, I know Oregon was. Um, these are old. Montana, and I think it was Washington. But anyways, they're never going to... Long story short on this one, just another the definition. Euthanasia, the doctor, illegal. Physician-assisted, doctor prescribed. But here's a, one of the take-home points. Uh, even as you're studying anything when it comes to ethics on the state, is typically they will not... When there's differences between states, they're typically not going to go down that road and make you know the difference between every state. It's usually whatever is going to be more of a federal across the board. So when there's state issues, a difference between, don't really worry about that as much. I wouldn't put my focus into that. Now, I would know the definition and what, it, what they mean, but I'm not going to get into the whole, well, oh, that means this because it's more of a state issue. Okay? So this is kind of the first video in this. We'll make another video that kind of gets the rest of the topics, but uh, hope this was helpful.